meet me at the lake. I wasn't sure what the tropes were. And my editor was like, Carly, it's a second chance for huh. And I was like, yeah, but is it? And she's like, yeah, it, it is. <laughs> it is, Carly. <laughs> um, but I, lo I love them and I'm fascinated by them. I'm just fascinated by them because there are tropes that people really hate, like, like Secret Baby. <laughs> Library was my space, and there was just so much. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the boys to have a time. Hi. 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 I am such, I'm such a big fan of both of you um, for various reasons. Curtis, I've been ride or die since prep. Oh. Yeah. Everybody can clap yeah. for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've devoured all of your work since. Um, romantic comedy is so good that I read it twice in one weekend. <laughs> I've read it three times now. <laughs> um, and yeah, you're brilliant. I just feel grateful to live in a time where I get to read your work. Ha, thank you, thank you. That's lovely. <laughs> um, and Carly used to be my boss. She's, she's, she's forced to be here. <laughs> and I'm, so I'm gonna say power. nice things to you when I'm not con <laughs> contractually obligated to. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I knew you were writing a novel, and I am a massive romance fan, so I think I was probably going to be one of your harshest critics, Yeah, I and know. I loved it. Thank Talking you. Talking about Every Summer After, of course. You blew us all away with that debut. Um, a New York Times bestseller on your first time out. Yeah. Like, yes. so, I'm so proud of you, but also mad. I think, like, who does that? I think that's just our dynamic. It is our dynamic. I like it, it when dynamic. you're a little mad. Um, okay, so yeah, you're here to talk about Meet Me at the Lake, which came out today. It did. Uh, so I'm assuming none of you have read it yet. Oh, okay. Okay, we got a couple. Whoa. We got a couple. Okay, Whoa. good to know. How many have read Romance Comedy? <laughs> yes. All right. This is what I was expecting. Okay, um, so I'm so excited to get to talk about romance and, and fiction with both of you. Um, First icebreaker question, what is your favorite romantic comedy? I will judge you by your answer. <laughs> We're talking about movies. Yes. Uh, do you consider 13 going on 30 a romantic comedy? Yeah. I 100 percent it is. Yes. 13 going on 30. <laughs> Great answer. Thank you. Curtis. Um, I well, okay, do you consider Dirty Dancing? A, a Ooh. Oh, no. I don't think I do. Okay, I, I, have, I have a backup. I, that was like a, um, uh, When Harry Met Sally. Yes. yes. Thank you. When Harry Met Sally. I, I got it on the choice. second try. You, you saved could it. stay. <laughs> uh, well, we were talking backstage about whether you two consider yourselves romance writers or romantic comedy writers, and and just my two cents, I mean, your book is called Romantic Comedy, Curtis, it is a romantic comedy, in my opinion. Uh, Carly, I wouldn't classify Every Summer After or Meet Me at the Lake as romantic comedy. So, no. but that designation, you guys had a fascinating conversation backstage about <laughs> that. And so I wanted to bring it to all of you. What do you think about it? Well, we were, um, you know, one of the questions that I get asked, and you asked me, is whether <laughs> um, I consider myself a romance writer, whether I consider the, the book Meet Me at the Lake and Every Summer After a romance. And I, I very much do um, because we have a central love story. There's a happy ending and it was really, especially when I started writing Every Summer After, I, I wrote that book for myself and I, all I could kind of tolerate in life was a happy ending and I, I needed that. Um, and Meet Me at the Lake is, is also a romance. But it, I, I also wanted to explore a, a lot of other things. And when I finished Every Summer After, I actually didn't know what it was. <laughs> I was like, is this a bit of, is this YA? Is this a romance? Is this something else? Um, and I still, I still kind of think that about that book. It's like many things, I, I think. And I mean, romantic comedy is just so many, so many things, romance being one of them. What, what do you, what do you feel? I mean, I do, I would, I definitely do think it's, I think that romantic comedy is a romantic comedy. Um, <laughs> I, it, it is interesting because even though, like, it's, in some ways, it's kind of, um, like, I, I feel like, why did I ask you that backstage? Because I, when someone asks me, I, I kind of feel like, like all these um, categories are sort of marketing and book selling categories. And I think there are some writers 
who really self-identify, but I think there are more who just like write the book they want to write, and then the publisher, you know, if if they're lucky enough to be to be published, the publisher says, oh, like you wrote, mm -hmm. you know, a coming of age novel, yes. or you wrote YA, or you wrote, yes. um, so so it's like, yeah, like I don't, I, I feel like. Um, I mean, it's probably one of the less embarrassing things, but I'm less personally divulging things of all the topics we covered backstage. But, <laughs> but I also think, like, why did I ask you that? Because like, it's, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's an interesting, the categorization thing is kind of interesting. And it's interesting because I think that categorization has led to some maybe unfair designations in the past, like Chicklet we were talking about. Um, that category, those books that would, be put in that category are now called romantic comedies officially. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think they've probably always been. And then that designation, which again, I'm like all about chiclet. I'm sure so many of us in this room are. I don't think that is a negative um, category. I think there's so many great books written under that. But it has been in the past used to be like, well, that's that over there. And it's not good writing. Yeah. Yeah. Lie. I mean, I think, you know, those of us in this room know that <laughs> that's not true. And we know that there are fantastic romances and fantastic rom-coms. But there are many people outside this room who will still give you side, side eye for writing romance. Or um, I, I had somebody ask me, are you going to write other books? Like, are you just going <laughs> to write these kinds of books? Like, can you, are you allowed to write something else? Um, so that, that exists for sure. Um, I'm gonna need a name and an address <laughs> <laughs> after this. Uh, Curtis said you guys are probably gonna laugh at everything we said, which is great. I love it. I love it. Please keep going. Um, I said okay. this is what I said. I did say. I said. I said. I. So I've been. You know. Obviously, it's such a joy to be here for Carly's. You know, publication. Like to share someone else's super exciting day. I'm. I'm sharing your glory and <laughs> magic and like no. trying not to fangirl. Huh. Huh. <laughs> but I, like because so I my book came out a month ago and I said it's it is. So so palpable how much people are ready for like pleasure and fun and yes. lightness and like you know pleasurable reading and pleasurable conversations and, and so it's not it's not because I mean I think we are hilarious but it's not because <laughs> it's not because of how hilarious it's just because like everyone is so desperate for like a joyful positive experience yeah, that's yes. why that's why <laughs> Yes, we are. Okay, so let's talk about the, the joy and positivity of, of these two novels. I want to set up the basics of these stories first. I think most of you know, but um, Romantic Comedy is set in the world of the Night Owls, which is basically Saturday Night Live. It is a live sketch comedy show. happens every Saturday night. Um, and the protagonist, Sally, is a writer for the show, and she falls for you know one of the celebrity guests, this like hot celebrity guest star. Um, unexpectedly, and then Carly, Meet Me at the Lake, it, it follows Fern. Uh, she heads back to the lakeside resort that her mother used to own um, in Muskoka, and her long lost love from her 20s, she's reunited with him, with Will. Um, and both TNO and Brooks Banks Resort, Brooke Banks Resort, act as these kind of insular worlds mm -hmm. in which uh, they are the backdrop for these romances. So let's talk about the world building and how you both chose these settings. Uh, Curtis, I'm gonna start with you. Um, well, the way that I, I came to write romantic comedy was um, I, I felt like, I mean, it sounds very similar to your experience, Carly, where you know the, the pandemic sort of arose. And um, I actually had a novel, Rodham, come out in May 2020, sort of published. Oh, some <laughs> commotion for Rodham, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> um, but it was you know, published into this world that n no one had expected or anticipated. Um, and at the time when I would do my Zoom events, you know, I did no live events, and I would, I would, if somebody said, well, what are you gonna write next? And I would say, I wanna write something short and fun. And then I worked for, uh, on a book for maybe eight months, um, and then reached the conclusion that it was like not short and also not fun. <laughs> um, and, and so I was kind of like casting around and, and feeling, you know, just like like I I need to create my own escape or my own joy while I'm working and writing, 
And also during the pandemic, my family had been watching a lot of Saturday Night Live, and I had noticed this, you know, phenomenon of, of the sort of, you know, talented but ordinary men from the show dating these super gorgeous female celebrity guests. Name names. I know, I know, yeah, I know. Like, we can, we can we say. We all know. Don't worry. I know. I'll, I'll sadly, it sadly, the writers' strike has. Um, I mean. Like obviously, of course, as as a writer, I stand with the writers and want them to be fairly paid. And um, Pete Davidson's will not be hosting <laughs> SNL this Saturday. He was going to return so so soon. Anyway, so we we can come back to Pete <laughs> Davidson at any moment. Um, I now do spend like m like about an hour a day talking about Pete Davidson. Like, <laughs> um, anyway, so so I had thought to myself. Someone, while, while my family watched SNL, I would think someone should write a screenplay for a romantic comedy where there's like a woman who notices this pattern and thinks how it would never happen for the ordinary woman writer and the smoking hot male celebrity. And then that week she has chemistry with the guest host. And then after I set aside my not short and fun novel, <laughs> I thought like, oh, maybe that screenplay should be a novel and maybe that someone who should write it is me. <laughs> um, and so that was basically how romantic comedy came into existence. I love, I love that. We're so glad that you did that. Yes. And it's just like, it, I was fascinated by um, how ambitious it was considering you or never a writer for Saturday Night Live to get all of the um, the details so perfectly, it seemed as as reading it. So let's talk a little bit about the research that it took uh, to yeah to build TNO. Well, it was it was really such a joy. Like to do to do the research was literally like walking around. I live in Minneapolis. It was like walk, walking out in the snow, listening to. Um, for instance, like comedian podcasts like Mike Birbiglia interviewing Bowen Yang or Mark Marin interviewing, you know, Lauren Michael, one, yeah. one of many beloved Canadians. Um, uh, so it was like, it was so much fun. Like it couldn't, I mean, there's, there's the, this like epic 750 page oral history called Live from New York, um, you know, that starts in 1975 and, and comes almost up to the present day. There's like so many memoirs. I mean, I had already, of course, I had read Bossy Pants and Amy Poehler's Yes, Please, but there I read, I think about six other memoirs, including um, Molly Shannon's and Colin Jost and Tracy Morgan's and- Colin Jost who also is one of those. Yes, dudes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Scarlett Johansson. Yeah. Yes, he, who, and uh, uh, as a side note, a very, his um, book, A Very Punchable Face, is like a delight. To, I, we, can, we can also, we can, you know, I defer to you on how much time to spend. I, I think that both Colin Jost and Pete Davidson are lovely and, and attractive <laughs> in different ways, and, and we can, um, but, but we... You did not have to do that, but that's fine. No, it's they're, true. They're it's, fine. It's they're totally, good. it's sincere. <laughs> I mean, I, between the two... But I get it, you got, you know, you're not, you're not out here to trash Pete Davidson mm. or Colin Jost. No, 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 no. You're just no. pointing out what happens. Yeah, yeah. It's more. I'm, I'm, like, I'm here to raise the question of, yeah, like why, why it doesn't happen the other way. Not like why does it happen this way, but why doesn't it happen? Like why is, it, why are all funny women not like fending off, you know, <laughs> yes. super, super hot celebrities? Yes. Asking for a friend. <laughs> I, I want to get more into that, but um, can I ask a follow-up question though, just for a minute? I mean, and I'm like flanked <laughs> by two two journalists. Two. <laughs> I'm just so I'm just so curious. Once you've done all that research, I've stayed. I feel so allergic to doing projects with a lot of research, oh. um, because of my journalism experience. Yeah. So once you've absorbed yourself in in that world, do you have a bucket? Like, do you have notes where you're like, I got to get all this stuff in, or do you just sit down and you're like, I I am a late night comedy show writer. I know everything now and it com comes together. How do you, um, how do you somewhere do that? in between. So um, I, a lot of times, I mean, I do, if I'm reading something, I would like take notes. Although if I'm walking around, it's like, you know, if I take my phone out of my pocket, it'll die because it's so cold in Minnesota. <laughs> but um, but so actually I heard the writer Mona Simpson, who I really admire years ago. I feel like this like was so influential to me, but she basically said 
that she writes, instead of preemptively doing a ton of research, she writes up to the point where she knows exactly what she needs. So in some cases, mm -hmm. it's like if I'm writing an, you know, a scene and it's on Tuesday night um, at the offices and that's the night that everyone stay, the writers stay overnight and it's like, and I'm thinking, well, okay, who's in a room with whom and who's, you know, like, what's the sequence and, and what happened? Do they go to bed at two? Like, do they take a nap? Are they up the whole night? Like, you know, do you eat a snack? If you get coffee, is there a kitchen on that floor? So it's like almost, like almost the way if you were planning a trip and you were trying, like you were taking some of your own food and so you'd think, well, we'll be driving for lunch and it'll be really rural, so we should pack, like it's yeah. almost kind of walking yourself through it in your head. You're amazing. This is ah, just, inc just incredible. Ah. <laughs> yeah, and it's great, you know, if you, like me, love behind the scenes mm -hmm. um, of any sort of entertainment or show, this book really feels a, a bit like pulling back the curtain behind Saturday Night Live. And then you get the love story. It's just yeah, like, exactly. I just can't stop smiling. Um, Carly, we have to talk about okay, you. Okay, fine, sure. I'm so sorry. I guess. <laughs> I don't want to. So, <laughs> uh, you said you're allergic to research. Yeah. You, so, you grew up it. in Barry's Bay, Ontario. I did. Shout out, Barry's Bay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, Nobody heard of, had, had ever heard about Barry's Bay. If, like, well, apparently, I, I, that's not true. I lived in Toronto for 20 years, and nobody <laughs> knew about Barry's Bay. And now, now people are all popping out of the woodwork. Uh, so this is set in Muskoka, which I can imagine has a very similar vibe. No. It does not at all? <laughs> oh. Oops. Um, <laughs> there are lakes. There's trees. Okay, so tell me yeah. about the about the research then that you that you did. Well, I, so Barry's Barry's Bay um, is not that far from the eastern side of Muskoka. Muskoka is uh, the most popular cottaging region just north of Toronto, and uh, but Barry's Bay is about four hours from Toronto. It's on the like east side of Algonquin Park, whereas Muskoka is a lot cl closer and therefore um, more populated a lot more expensive, um, a, like Ritz, just a lot more glam, like Cindy Crawford's up in Muskoka, um, whereas Barry's Bay is very working class. Um, you know, there's more, pe especially since the pandemic, there's, there's a lot more people there, but it's, qu it's quiet, and, and um, the town does transform in, in the summer, but not in the way that Muskoka does. It, it's different, and I... Um, but be, because I grew up on one side of Algonquin Park and Muskoka is on the other side of um, Algonquin Park, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with it. And uh, but I set the resort, Brookbanks Resort, on the eastern side of Muskoka because I just want. I just, it's it's really not about Muskoka. The only reason I put the resort in Muskoka is because a character takes a dig at Muskoka in every summer after, and I was like, you know what? <laughs> I should be nice to them. Let's <laughs> let's put the resort there, um, outside of Huntsville, and it really. But it, the the world is really the resort. Um, it's 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 mostly this you know kind of dirty dancing style, um, huge lodge, uh, at which there were. That's the other thing. You know there were these amazing getaways in Muskoka, um, built in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Clark. Clark Gable did holiday there, um, and it was a real time. And so I wanted to have this kind of old resort um, with the cabins on the water. If you've seen, I think it's season three of Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, where they go, I think they're in the Catskills. Yeah, so it's just that kind of feeling, except, um, you know, the resort's not doing so well, and um, Fern's, Fern's back home very unhappily trying to run the place following her mother's death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's upbeat and fun. Um, it's a lot it of really things. Is, it's, it it's, is. Yeah, it's, it's fun and it's like, I think it's very tender. I think it's tender. It is. It <laughs> is. Yeah, and I mean, uh, can you tell I, I did not cottage in the summers with my family? But um, yeah, no, I mean, this is why I, I assumed that you grew up in a world like Muskoka, like I would no. assume that Curtis is a writer for <laughs> SNL because these worlds are so um, beautifully crafted and Thank realistically you. built. Well, I, I grew up with 
I mean, I grew up on the lake, um, and we were on, in, the, in the middle of the bush on a dirt road, but we were the family who lived there all year round. So my first book, the character of, of Sam, that's his life, and his, his, parent, his mom owns a restaurant. That, that, like, he and I are very similar. That's how I grew up. My family had an inn and a restaurant, and the, the hospitality business is uh, all-consuming and punishing, and we didn't live on the property um, like Fern, Fern did, but I am so familiar with with that world and also like how you um you have these guests who come back year after year or who um come for dinner once a week in the summer and over time they become like family and you have these re long-standing relationships with people and i wanted to pay a bit of tribute to that too yeah i love that and i mean curtis with with prep you went to uh a prep school like that. And I wonder if it's, um, is it comforting or freeing to write about something that's like nothing like your life or to, to kind of lean into what you know? Um, I mean, I think probably some of both. Like I, I do think that writing prep, which was set in, as you described, like an insular world and an insular world that I was familiar with like it was it was almost like writing a novel with training wheels or something and so I could be like well I know this I can confidently depict this and then with other books depicting more insular worlds that I didn't have first experience first hand experience with like the White House or um, like Saturday Night Live um, you know so it, it made it kind of tempting but there there is something i do think like setting can be so rich in novels and um i mean i think i think in some ways i'm like writing in a lot of different ways the novel that i want to read whether it's like in tone the escapist novel that i want to read or like i want to have the curtain peeled back and i want to know what goes on and and yeah i yeah. mean yeah don't you, I feel like with romances too, when the setting feels so real, the, the, the romance itself feels more real. Like, oh, you're, yeah. like you're, you have access to these real people because the setting is so well drawn. I, like I felt that with your book for sure. Um, that's an interesting, yeah. I mean, I think probably, I think that grounding something in a real specific place always makes it feel more real you know like like there can be I don't know I, I think that um, when I was in graduate school which was like 20 years ago it was almost like the tail end of a certain kind of popularity of like st like these minimalist stories written kind of in the 80s where it'd be like the man said this and you know he did like and then he closed his door and you'd be like what city does this take place <laughs> in and like what what's this man's name and like I I like I feel like more is more to me when it, with details with with character with place with yeah yeah I agree well if we're talking about what what works in romance setting is included in that but also let's talk about tropes because I yeah. think romance tropes are something that get a bad rap in this genre, even though there are tropes in every genre. Um, and I think both of your books could fall into categories if you wanted to, like Nerd Gets the Girl, huh. the romantic comedy, but in the, the inverse. And then um, like Reconnected Love, Long Second Lost chance romance. Loves. Second Chance Romance. That's what Book Talk calls it. Huh. Right. Huh. You're right. That's the trope. Um, so let's talk about, about tropes and if there was ones that you specifically wanted to subvert or ones that you wanted to tap into. Because, I mean, I think uh, a trope is, is great as long as you do it well. Well, I, so before I came to romance, I associated, when I thought of the word trope to me, it had a negative connotation. But it absolutely does not <laughs> in, like, the, the romance reading community. It is, um, you know, we, people have their favorite tropes. Like, uh, you know, my favorite trope, which I've not written, is um, enemies to lovers or, like, rivals to lovers enemies. more specifically. Um, and, but, and people, you know, they look for, they look for the thing. Romance is... Um, so comforting and joyful and it gives you pleasure and so you so you look for the books that best do that for you right like s sometimes you do as a reader or some readers do and um so I, I think they're really like can be very useful um i don't you, I, they're not part of my toolkit as a writer like it's not i think some writers so beautifully are like i'm gonna do a 
enemies to lover. There's just one bed. Um, there's. Um, Wait, is just one bed a trope? Yeah, just oh, one yeah. bed. It is, yeah. Wait, is there are there is there's there a one, novel? There's called? one hotel room left <laughs> here tonight, and oh my goodness, yeah. there's, there's just one bed. There's only one bed. I actually do love that trope. Uh, I, I do too. I See, it. it's good. I'm like, like it's, what are they gonna like, do? There's only one bed. Mm. Ha have to show like I, I just got anyway. shivers. How <laughs> glorious! Um, and and but but and uh, so I uh, and, and I think some writers do like have fun pl playing with that. They're thinking about like what they. But I um, I'm I haven't used that as a way of idea generating. And even like with this with. Um, Meet me at the lake. I wasn't sure what the tropes were, and my editor was like, "Carly, it's a second chance romance." Huh. And I was like, "Yeah, but is it?" And she's like, "Yeah, it, it is. It is, Carly." <laughs> um, but I love I love them, and I'm fascinated by them. I'm just fascinated by them because pe there are tropes that people really hate, like like secret baby. <laughs> Right? Some, there are people here who hate Secret Baby. I mean, Wait, I don't even... I know. Who has the Secret Baby? And, is it like no, Secret... No, it's like, yes, I, I hate a Secret Baby. I Wait, know exactly what you're Wait, talking is about. Wait, is it Secret Pregnancy? Or is it like Secret... Or somebody has a Secret Baby? or Yeah, yeah like on the... But I haven't read very many books with Secret Baby. But I know. I there's will a have lot of like Secret Pregnancies. I'm, in, I'm reading the, the, the worst, I will not say. I'm reading the worst. <laughs> Uh, romance series right now, just because I don't know why. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot. There's a lot of like good. it has to end in a pregnancy, and I hate it so much. <laughs> I don't know why I'm reading them. Anyway, <laughs> it's like a my before bed. Um, anyway, I lost my train of thought. But okay, let's talk about the leads. Oh no, Curtis, you got to answer the trope question. Um, it's the, the, the essential question is like, do I think in terms of tropes? Yeah, tropes and if there was, because I mean, I felt watching romantic comedy, or sorry, reading romantic comedy, that uh, you, especially with the title as well, that maybe you felt like there were things in romances that were like super uh, not believable, or that there were tropes that needed kind of a real, a more real approach to. Well, so were you thinking about that when you were writing? So I, I think I would say, I think I understand why you would think that, but I would probably say no. So I, I started reading romances when I was like about 10 and read, um, you know, like I read Danielle Steele and I read Harlequin romances and I read which what I apparently are not still called bodice ripper, like the the where the wind, yeah. like the yeah. the ones that Fabio was a model for, yes. um, and so I I feel very much like um, romances are like in my bloodstream, mm. and but I didn't consciously think in terms of tropes when I was writing romantic comedy. It, weirdly, I think um, with some of my other books, I've gotten questions like people will say, um, you know, what's the message of your book? And it almost feels similar to me that I would never think in terms of a message like I, I feel like I think in terms of a very specific character and I, I almost feel like like I'm you know I mean this sounds creepy but like in, inside the character wearing their skin and like trying yeah. to get through the scene or something like that and so it's like seeing it from their eyes instead of looking at it from the outside and thinking of how it can be analyzed. And then of course it is analyzed and it would, you know, I know that like I'm lucky it will be published, it, it will be sort of dissected. So then there is a time when I kind of step outside and, and try to anticipate that. But I think, I think the trope thing is super interesting and it, I wouldn't say it guides me writing. Yeah, and I do think, you know, after the fact, um, it does kind of sometimes diminish the work to be like, oh, it's, it's just this thing. When, yeah, I don't think even that trope that I mentioned, like nerd gets the girl or whatever, really encapsulates what romantic comedy is. But it's just like, you know, there's only so many stories. So you yeah, can yeah, absolutely, yeah. Into absolutely. categories. Absolutely. I think, you know, probably every... I think many, many books, you could identify tropes within them in different genres. Um, my husband, who's very into music, talks about musical tropes all the time. Not, yeah. not, as, not negatively, just as a way of like bucketing things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. There's actually, I remember someone told me, who went to a different graduate writing program than I did, said a professor had said, um, every book is either 
um, a person leaves home or a stranger comes to town. That's oh. the point, and, and, <laughs> which I don't think that's true, but it's like a provocative and interesting yeah. thing to think about. That is, that is Which is, it doesn't account think, for secret baby. Well, your book is, <laughs> no. your book is a stranger comes to town. Yeah, yeah. And yours is a person leaves home, but then comes back. <laughs> and then a stranger comes to town. And then a stranger comes to town, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh my goodness, what? Sorry, I just got the 10 minute mark, and that's we're, wild. We're barely getting right? started. We've, we've that's, like, that's the, wait the, until the, we do our SNL skit. <laughs> I know, okay, okay, I wanna talk about these leads, because as much as, you know, the chemistry in a couple can make or break a romance. Um, the, the protagonist and the heroine can as well. And one of the similarities I saw between, um, between these two, between Fern and Sally, was um, that their self-confidence or lack thereof gets in their way, let's say. And so, you know, for Sally, it's the fact that she doesn't think that she, could, she can get uh, this, this hot man even though she's very confident in her work ability and her ability as a comedy writer. Um, and then for Fern, I think it's, it's taking over this resort for her mother. Um, and she's also confident in, in work and uh, the coffee shop that she runs in Toronto, but not necessarily in this next endeavor or also when it comes to Will. So let's talk about confidence. And it is something that I think makes them very relatable, which I think is necessary. But it also at times is really frustrating like when you're rooting for someone, you're like, why can't you just believe in yourself like I do? I like it when characters frustrate you. I like that's I am less concerned about a character being likable and more concerned about a character being compelling and uh, realistic. And I think sometimes. Um, I feel like I am amazing. Like I'm walking around going like, you did really well at this thing today. And other times I am just like mired in self-doubt. And I think that's, you know, how many of us are. And with Fern, we're seeing her, um, the book is told in, in two timelines and um, in her early 20s and in her early 30s. And at both time periods, she's at a crossroads and really questioning what it is she wants and um, what her her life should be and I think we all get to these points and, and you know in the present day she's she's grieving and we just we can't, we just can't do what like the reader is cheering her on but we it, it, it doesn't work like that life is hard and we don't always feel so amazing about ourselves and or other people and I'm really interested in um, how we work through these things. I think like I work through a lot of my own personal issues with, with my books and um, I, I, I'm okay with frustrating you a little bit, like as a reader. Wait, do you feel like you do it um, deliberately no, at all? Oh, no, okay. I just, I, I just really, I like my character, I like characters who are flawed. Like I, I, I just um, want to see, in, I love in romance when people have to work out their, can I swear? Ha. Like people have to work out their shit in order to. Um, that was just such a Carly thing. Like, can I swear you said the like most basic swear word? Like, yes, you can say shit, Carly. <laughs> I uh, like I like uh, to me. Great romances are people like getting over their shit or trying to get through their shit in order to like get together and find a happy ending. And like relationships are really, really hard and your relationship with yourself is super hard. And I, I, I like characters who are grappling with that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do Sally's insecurities inform her? Um, I mean, I think they're, they're a big part of her identity. And I, I also, I mean, I agree with everything that Carly is saying. Like, I, I think I'm also very interested in um, the sort of, our, the discrepancy between like our public selves and our private selves and, and like in a lot of different ways, like, like the way that, you know, in a, in a given day, like all of us probably do things that like we'd be horrified if someone else saw us doing that, you know, or, but then also like, or like whenever someone's texts are leaked, I always feel like, oh, you know, yeah. they're there, but for the grace of God, go out, like, or um, like, I think, I mean, this, again, I think this kind of dovetails on what you're saying that a person can be very competent in one area and very income. So you could be, you could be somebody who's like a super, 
you know, successful lawyer, but then like when you have to go to the dentist, you cry or like you can't, you can't drive on the highway. And it's like, oh, I can't drive at all. I don't have my license. Did you know this? Do you, I, wow. Drag me. Wait, you, <laughs> you, you don't have a license. No, There's a I very, failed my driver's test three times when I was 16 and then I gave up. Oh my God. I failed my driver's license twice when I was 16, <laughs> but then maybe, maybe we could work together in this, but then I got my driver's license when I was 18. And so, and, and I still, to this day, I think that my driver's license has like special value to me because it was hard one there's a um it just it means that you're like a talented writer and a sensitive person because there's a very high pr proportion of writers who because we like feel so many drive. things <laughs> yeah okay, because wow. it's because driving is like it's, it's like stressful it's yeah. overstimulating yeah. yeah it's that's very understandable we'll, we'll discuss <laughs> this there's a really there's actually a really beautiful essay i think it's by um, Katha Pollitt, who I think got her driver's license maybe when she was like in her 50s or something. Oh, anyway, wow. you're part of a very distinguished Thank you. club. <laughs> um, but, but so, but yeah, I do feel, I mean, here, like here you are like, you know, on stage, like you're so good at this, but you don't drive. Like it's so, I, it, to me, it's, it's so normal that almost nobody is like competent at everything. Sometimes there are some super boring people who are competent <laughs> at everything. <laughs> But like, but again, it's like, how much can you conceal it or how much do you show? So, so I do, I feel like I want to write characters or I aspire to write characters who are as complicated and like as contradictory as real people. Yes. And I think that, that was a great answer, both of you. Thank you. Um, I think that leads me to asking about these, these men, these heartthrobs that you have crafted. And it might be a similar answer, but... Um, I think that, you know, you had, you both had these difficult tasks of building men that we actually like, ha. <laughs> period, <laughs> period, um, but also, you know, ones with flaws who make mistakes, who aren't perfect. Yeah. Um, I would like to have some words with Will, just no spoilers, but I'd like to have some words with that man. Um, I'll call so, him up. So how do you go about that? And what are the challenges of creating this, like, this man that you know your audience has to fall in love with, along with Fern and along with Sally? Um, well, I think that, like, for me, it starts with the main character. It starts with Fern and trying to figure out who the right fit is for her. But Will was, um, he was a really difficult character to pinned down he was the most difficult character of the book and like par like part of it is easy like the the easy part is like making him hot like he's hot right <laughs> so like uh. you you like try to like write the like best description you can that seems really dreamy so there's that but wait um, can you give us some specifics no for those of us who haven't had the pleasure <laughs> of reading it, like what does he look like well he okay so he looks very different in the in the past than he does in the present so in, in his 20s he's this like idealistic artist and then in the present day he's this slick business guy he's very tall um perhaps too tall he's got <laughs> <laughs> dark hair it's like long when he's younger longer uh, or yeah longer ish and then sh short when when he's older he's um got beautiful dark eyes he's got a little bit of a largish nose but he he um yeah he's just like very handsome he's got tattoos mm -hmm. um and he's got an artist soul and he has a lot of dreams and <laughs> He really sees Fern. This is, this is, I think, what the key is. Um, for me, are um, characters who make you feel, you want some, some or the perfect romantic interest is somebody who makes you feel seen in like all ways, like you are, of all the people, you are so special and um, they, they notice that you're washing the dishes, but they also notice that when you're unhappy, you tilt your head to the right and you, you, you know, like grimace like this and they, they have their focus on you and you, the beautiful thing is when you, you let yourself be seen and, and because, and then they're the person that you want to be seen by. There's just, I just think like there's this, um, moment, these moments in the, in the book where it's like, oh, he really gets her. Like he really sees her and values her and she maybe doesn't want him to, but he, he, he does. Like he is the one who, who sees her. And, um, for me, that's, that's kind of 
really important. And then respect and like listening and um, like consent. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think it's the being seen thing. I actually totally agree. Like it's, it's funny because some people um, have sort of said to me like, you know, Noah is this pop singer and he, so he's like a famous celebrity, yeah. but that he's also very nice. Um, and, and some people have said like, oh, is he, is he realistic? Or like, like people have been like, like, <laughs> where's my Noah? You know, yeah, like, how, yeah. like do, how, how would I ever find one? And, but the funny thing is I do, I have almost felt like based on some heterosexual women's reaction to the book, I'm like, if a man, if a heterosexual man was having trouble dating, he almost could like, t like t whatever, like take a few. But the thing, exactly what you're saying, Carly, that I don't be a decent human being. I don't. Well, I, yes. I don't think. I think it's not yes. that he's a celebrity who lives in a mansion. I think no. it's that he's actually like a great listener. Yes. He pays attention to what she says and remembers it. And is like just like nice and affectionate and, and respectful. And he thinks she's brilliant. Yeah, she like, is. Yeah, she's yeah, brilliant. like he thinks she's yeah, and he likes the indigo girls, which is very endearing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he could think she was hotter, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that there is a moment where she, where like like he yeah he says almost like if you were like if I saw like she's kind of saying like how can you go out with me? I'm not. You could go. You could find someone better. Is that what you're referring yes. to? Yeah. And and he says if. If I saw a picture, like if I'm being honest, if I saw a picture of like the whole cast of the, the show, would I pick you out as the most gorgeous one? Like, no, but like people are not static images. And, and she, I think she's sort of like, like insulted and appreciates his <laughs> honesty and, and. I think that's exactly how I was feeling, which yeah. is like a testament to your writing. Yeah. I was like, how dare he? Well, but but uh, then he, for me. he does, he does later. Then he's like, no, I am super attracted. Oh, he's always said, I'm super attracted to you. He's, he's kind of saying like, no, you are not the most gorgeous, which I, I think, I mean, I, I felt conscious of wanting to let the reader decide because Sally is insecure about her appearance or she's, she's almost not even insecure. Like she's, well, she, I guess she is insecure. It's the but gap. It's the it, hot gap. It's right, right. It's right. It's it's that is she like she feels like she's average, and but I don't specifically describe what no. she looks like because I wanted to let the reader decide. Like, is she sort of homely? Is she um, whatever that means? Is she like hot and doesn't know it, or is she in fact average as she as she kind of says she is? Yeah, it was really interesting. I feel like the the closest we've gotten in real life to this dynamic is Jenny Slate and Chris Evans. Mm. But oh. Jenny Slate is so, so hot. hot. Yeah. But I do think she would maybe describe herself in these terms. Oh, I hope not. We got to I we hope gotta, not too. We got to talk to Jenny. You know, she probably I don't know, she's dating fucking Captain America. Um, okay, <laughs> I, I know we we're supposed to wrap up to audience questions. I'm so sorry to take your time, but I I want to talk about sex, baby. <laughs> Just on My last brand. question. It is on brand. I, as Carly knows, I am a very horny human being. <laughs> <laughs> the hornier, the better in my romance books. My biggest critique will be like, yeah. is it horny enough? When I was writing sex scenes for every summer after, I was like, will Kathleen think this is horny enough? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for thinking of me. And you did say that when you were writing the sex scenes in Meet Me at the Lake that you tried to do a fade to black and your, your editor was like, oh, no. Yeah. I, well, I, there's a very long sex scene in that book. Like, it's pa pages and pages and pages. <laughs> and I just thought, like, this is a, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> a lot. And, and then Amanda was like, but what about a bit more? <laughs> she said, you don't have to. I'm just being the voice of your readers. Ha! Huh. <laughs> I said fine. She's like asking for a friend. Can you just do a little more? All right. We'll, we'll wrap it. We'll, we'll, we'll get it in there. <laughs> um, what I love, Curtis, in romantic comedy is that I was like laughing through some of the sex, like the, the first big one, um, as well as, as being like, yeah, this is horny. I like it. <laughs> um, so just but like, talk about, I think that, you know, it's probably like a very base level, a maybe annoying question of like, how did you do the sex scenes? But um, I do think it is a skill, having read a lot of them. Um, so <laughs> how, how are you thinking about that, and how, how did you approach them? Um, well, I, one, you do, it is one of those moments where you kind of have to, like, pretend that maybe no one will ever read the book or something, you know, <laughs> like, like you, because there are times when, you know, like the, there is the voice of like, oh, you know, th this will get reviewed or whatever. Um, I mean, I actually think 
that this might be dodging the question, but you know, so I wrote, I wrote Rodham, which is this, um, you know, alternate history of what if Hillary and Bill had fallen in love at Yale Law School and then he had proposed, but she had said no and gone her own way. And there are sex scenes, and it turns out, I'm sure that Canadians feel differently, it turns out many Americans don't want to read sex scenes between, <laughs> between 1970s Hillary and Ben. So like, they were kind of mocked, and like people would take screenshots. And, and I felt, I mean, I, th I think I'm hard to offend, but I felt a little bit like it was like a bad faith thing to do. Because I was like, I, I live in the same world you do. I know you can take a screenshot. Like, I've written it anyway, because I think it serves the plot and develops the characters and shows this side of them. You know, like, again, their private selves. So in some ways, I kind of felt like, okay, I'm going to write... Um, like anyone who was like, ew, like I'm gonna sort of show you that I'm proficient at writing sex scenes. Like it's like, it was, it was the Hillary and Clinton, it was the Hillary and Bill, like Clinton thing, it wasn't me or whatever, it was like, um, I'm gonna write horny sex scenes for Kathleen and other people, no. But, but so I think, I think some of it is, I mean, it's like other scenes, like it's like trial and error and like, I mean, this is, again, if you've, if you've said shit on stage, I guess I could, like sometimes I do think in terms of like, how um, like specific or explicit, which I think sometimes yeah. again in a heterosexual or like in a like it comes out like it's like are you using the word like penis erection or something else or are you like just kind of being a little vague yeah. like a little yes. more shadowy which also might be like a TV I feel like I kind of maybe lost you we were all we were doing so well tonight like, <laughs> no I totally don't. I mean anyone who reads romance knows that there's some writers who are like call it you know his member or yeah. her like yeah. garden or, or something or, or like you don't like it's almost like it's almost like a TV show where like you see someone fully naked or like you're like did I just see them or did I not just yeah. see them like it's kind of, by the way have you all read um, The Idea of You by Robin Lee Oh my God! Oh, Which is like, have you read it? I haven't. No. Oh my God! It gets like an A plus in, in horniness oh. and in oh, other things. It down. has so many sex scenes, and they're super like artfully done. So it's basically, <laughs> it's like a. The premise is, um, it's kind of like a Harry Styles stand-in, like a boy band. Oh. I know, so they're uh, adapting this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and and this, yes. there's and a glamorous divorced mom in LA. So so she becomes involved with this like 20 year old. So it's kind of like doomed but hot. I highly <laughs> recommend it. Oh yes, I've, it's been on my list. Yeah. Oh, they tonight. Go go yes. go like yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Cannot wait.